Hello everyone, James here here. So I saw this video by Revival Fitness titled uh, These Six Walking Mistakes Are Killing Your Gains. Now before I actually address it, I do want to say that I actually think his training advice overall is pretty good. It's pretty useful. He recommends you know being a surplus, uh, not completely divorcing strength from uh, muscle gains. Overall, having some sort of emphasis on big compound movements, so I agree with a lot of the stuff he has to say training-wise. That being said, I can't really say the same thing about uh, his nutrition advice. The part where he discussed um, the problems with mainstream diet advice, especially specifically on this video, were, well, disappointing to say the least. This is because he has spread a bunch of misinformation and claims that you will hear in certain like diet tribes on the internet, but like when you confront them against real evidence from nutrition science, well, they are either lacking or just demonstrably wrong. So first I left him a comment explaining why he was wrong and then he responded with honestly even worse arguments. I then responded back and he never responded uh, back again, which, you know, I guess that's fine. He's has the right to engage or not, I'm sure he's getting lots of comments every day. But um, that kind of made me want to uh, make a proper response to his stuff, so I can elaborate a little bit further, which is what this video is all about. I know this is something a little bit different, I did do a response video, I think a few years ago now, to Greg to set. Um, this may not become a common thing, but I do want to make a response to this. Uh, unless he actually makes a video or something, which I highly doubt, I don't think there will be a follow-up to this uh, to this conversation, but if he does make a video, then yeah, I will make a video back. So, in typical style to most videos, I will be playing uh, his clips and responding to him. And I will also be responding to the comments he left me uh, to me after that in his comment section. And in case anyone, including you, Revival Fitness, uh, want to check my sources for the relevant stuff, all of it will be on the description box. So with that being said, let's get to it. So to reiterate, I will be responding to his part about mainstream diet advice. Which begins around 11 minutes and 20 seconds and finishes around 17 minutes something, 40 seconds I think. I don't know, I mean the time stamps will be on the description uh, for his video, so yeah. I'm probably on screen, so you should be able to tell that apart. And yes, I have my computer in front of me, I have some bullet points and studies because there is a lot to cover and I was not going to memorize all of it. So this leads us into point number four here, and this one's going to anger a lot of you just a heads up. But it is taking mainstream diet advice. People still love to have the appeal to authority and they say, oh, well, this organization recommends this and they say this isn't healthy, this is healthy. This is not the mindset you want to have, guys, just loosely speaking in many cases for your diet, but especially when it comes to adding serious muscle mass. So what I'm going to put on the screen now, guys, is a graphic from the new Tufts College food ranking system. So on this list, as you can see here, the bars in green are what they deem the most healthy so-called foods. Down at the bottom in the red are what they deem the most unhealthy. So on this list are 53 General Mills of cereals. They describe all as healthier than cheddar cheese, milk, and eggs cooked in butter, and even eggs in general. And these include the Dora the Explorer cereal, Berry Burst Cheerios, Count Chocula, Lucky Charms, and Chex Chocolate. Even a basic chicken filet that is grilled is ranked as 50 on this list, while Cheerios are ranked as a 95. Reese's Puffs are a 71, as are chocolate Cheerios on this list, making them far healthier to eat than chicken, and way, way, way healthier than ground beef at the bottom, which got a 26 rating. So... Um, this part of the video begins by him making a point against blindly taking nutrition authorities or organizations for their word. I'm sure he is not going to just reference someone he considers an authority and call it a day. I'm sure he is, you know, gonna take us through actual research um, and we're gonna actually see why this mainstream advice is so bad. 
He starts by referencing the Food Compass Nutrition Profile System made by Mosafarian and colleagues and published in the journal Nature. Oh, oh wait, wait, no, 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 hold on, hold on. You guys may be surprised to know that General Mills is a funder of the Tufts Food Institute. Sorry, what? Oh, oh, he actually referenced a tweet by Nina Takels that more or less referenced the study, but in a way that lacked nuance and was a little bit dishonest. But anyway, uh, I wouldn't take anything that Nina uh, Takels says too seriously, but that's something for a different video. Let's stick to what Regabel Fitness is putting forward. So, the paper is pretty interesting. It looked at over 8,000 different food items and ranked them based on nutrition ratios, sorry, based on nutrient ratios, vitamins, minerals, food ingredients, additives, processing, specific lipids, fiber and protein, and phytochemicals. And there is actually a study that came out afterwards titled Validation of food compounds with a healthy diet, cardiometabolic health, and mortality among U.S. adults, 1999-2018, by O'Hearn and colleagues. This second paper gives a fair amount of credence to the food compass because it found that people whose diet had a higher rank on the nutrient profiling system of the food compass also had better blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic, better blood lipids, better fasting blood glucose levels, lower prevalence of metabolic diseases like cancer and cardiovascular disease, among other things. So yes, following this uh, nutrient profiling system, the food compass was actually making people healthier. At least, you know, having a diet that scored higher on uh, this system. So it's worth noting that just because a food is healthy by this system, or any system for that matter, whether it's Weight Watchers or whatever, it doesn't mean that you cannot overeat it, overeat it and there is bound to be some variation um, based on individual specific circumstances as far as whether you know a food is ideal for you or not, so keep that in mind. But that being said, as a tool for the general population to assess the health value of a given food, I think it's actually pretty decent. So then what are the problems that he sees with it? Well, he referenced Nina Takel's tweet, which in my opinion made a little bit of a dishonest comparison. Um, it showed the nutrient profiling scores of some cereal brands and the worst scoring animal products based on the food compass, and implied that the reason that this animal product score so low was because it was funded by General Mills. Yeah. However, you can dismiss studies based purely on conflicts of interest, and although General Mills does have a partnership, uh, a partnership with Tufts University, it's not directly mentioned in the, comp in the competing interest section of the study, so it's unlikely they had a big influence in the methodology used. Also, editing one here, I want to add that the study that came up after that found that the people who followed or who scored higher on the food compass were overall healthier didn't have any funding from any grain companies from what I could see from the competing intersection. So yeah, at this point it's kind of, it's kind of mute. That being said, if, if Revable Fitness has evidence that the scores for General Mills products were artificially inflated or ranked differently, I would love to see it. Now onto the, onto the animal products. Um, it seems to me that the reason that the animal products he showed had a low score is because he specifically chose the worst scoring products. Uh, he chose eggs cooked in butter that had a score of 29 over 100 and ground beef with a score of 26 over 100. This is because the food compass places emphasis on things like fat quality and food groups which have a probable or convincing evidence for impacts on chronic diseases including cardiovascular diseases, type 2 diabetes or cancer among other things. The thing is, red meat was considered a, a probable carcinogen by the World Health Organization so it is very likely that has something to do with the system that they use for it ranking uh, at least somewhat low. Now personally, I wouldn't give credence to probable carcinogens. Um, I will take like actual carcinogens more seriously because the probable carcinogens are usually things that don't really have enough evidence in humans and it's mostly just mechanistic studies. Which I will cover that and the hierarchy of evidence in general in a little bit. 
I will also cover the issue of fat quality a little bit uh, later in the video because I know he will bring that up specifically. Uh, but when it comes to this, uh, to meat, it seems that the fat and preservatives are the major issues with the link it has with cardiovascular disease. As far as the relationship it has with cancer, I will agree that so far the evidence is probably not compelling enough to say that it definitely causes cancer. Uh, as far as the eggs cooked in butter, well, he chose the worst scoring types of eggs. <laughs> Again, likely because they are cooked with butter, which is high in saturated fat. Again, I'll cover that in a little bit. But, you know, regular egg products that weren't cooked in butter actually score relatively better, like in the 50s. And yes, the cereals did score, did, did score high. I think that has to do with them being high in fiber because that can be uh, somewhat beneficial for certain things. So maybe that the point of view of the authors was that if it was contributing significantly to the fiber intake, then, you know, that will be a reason to make it score higher. I'm not 100% sure of that, but it doesn't seem to me like General Mills was necessarily chosen to score higher. I think that's just what the algorithm ended up uh, giving them after they put the nutrients in. But again, maybe I'm wrong, and if I am, then feel free to point it out to Rebel Fitness. Show me the evidence that they fudged the results uh, to be favorable towards General Mills or something. The current dietary guidelines are an absolute joke. The vast majority of them are not based in any real science. A lot of them as well as we saw in the prior example. They are funded by cereal companies and grain companies and people with ulterior motives. I'm not going to go into it all now guys, but you can look this up. This is not some conspiracy. This is well-known information if you actually care to look for it. Okay, on the next session, section he goes on to talk about how various food companies uh, lobby for nutrition guidelines according to their interests, and he is right in that various food companies do try to influence dietary guidelines, but here's the thing. Basically, every major commercially available food item has a funding board behind it, where that is grains, soft drinks, meat, eggs, dairy, fish, heck, even mangoes. The fact is that conflicts of interest on their own are not enough to discredit studies. And second, quite often the stuff that ends up in the dietary guidelines is supported by industry-funded and non-industry-funded studies alike. I will give you an example. Um, the idea that increasing dietary fiber intake helps to reduce the risk of heart disease. This is not something that was like made up by General Mills and cereal companies to promote their Cheerios or whatever. It has been seen in various studies that have looked on the subject, the benefits that you get from fiber. And I'm going to cover even more benefits in a little bit. So as I tell you guys a lot on this channel, your food quality matters. There are so many videos online, and a lot of the time they're just one-off things to get a lot of views. I understand that. But some of these people, man, you watch their full day of eating. A lot of these so-called fitness professionals now, I'll just say it, they eat like children. They are sugar addicts, right? They're always trying to find ways to just shoehorn more sugar into their diet, it might come in the form of sweeteners and stuff that are zero calorie, but they get that little rush from it. A lot of people have a very hard time eating truly clean. And I understand this point when it comes to bulking, because if you are only eating pure clean foods, you might not be able to hit your overall surplus. But even so, guys, you do want to make sure the vast majority of the food you are eating is whole food, minimally processed, one or only two or three perhaps ingredients to it. If you need to throw in a little bit of ice cream or fast food here and there to meet your caloric goal, that's fine, guys. But if those things are a cornerstone of your diet that you're eating every single day, I think you need to reconsider things. He then goes on to say how most fitness influencers eat a whole lot of low-calorie processed foods and would be better off eating more whole foods. And I don't necessarily disagree with what he says, but I do find the entire focus on whole food things to be at least partially a naturalistic fallacy because not necessarily the fact that something is whole is a whole food means that it's always going to be better than a, a processed food counterpart. We're going to cover that more in a little bit, but 
yeah, I mean, it's not a bad heuristic, but it's not true in every case either. But if you are going to follow the mainstream guidelines, it's going to be harder for you to hit your overall food intake goal. One of the biggest reasons being, fat is still demonized widespread. And saturated fat, of course, is always the main culprit. All right, now let's actually cover the main issue at hand. The elephant in the room, which is saturated fat. Whew. So, what is the issue with it? So, first of all, in short, fats, as they are commonly called, are molecules composed of carbon and hydrogen. When a double bond forms between two of those carbons, it's considered a monounsaturated fatty acid, and when we have two or more double bonds, it is considered a polyunsaturated fatty acid. Saturated fatty acids are solid at room temperature, while mono and polyunsaturated fatty acids are liquid at room temperature. In general, but there are exceptions, animal fats, some exceptions might include like certain fatty fish like trout and um, salmon, and eggs actually are, don't have that much saturated fat. Um, as well as some plants like cocoa, coconuts and palm tend to be higher proportionally in saturated fat, while plant sources of fat like nuts, seeds, avocados, and some animal products like eggs, trout and salmon again, tend to be higher in unsaturated fatty acids. The keyword here is proportionally because most fat sources will contain some amounts of unsaturated and some amount of saturated fatty acids. So the issue with saturated fat is that in multiple studies we have seen that lowering saturated fat intake in favor of sources of whole carbohydrates and unsaturated fatty acids results in lower concentrations of low density lipoproteins. To explain why this is important, we have to understand a little bit about human physiology first. As we know from middle school science class, oil and water don't mix. This is relevant because everything has to travel through your blood system and your blood system is mostly water. Because blood is mostly made up of water, for lipids to travel through the blood system they have to go into lipoproteins. There are different types of lipoproteins based on size and density but the main ones that are relevant here are low-density lipoproteins and high-density lipoproteins. You will hear this commonly called LDL and HDL respectively. These carry a type of lipid called cholesterol, which is sort of a waxy substance. LDL cholesterol is the cholesterol that is carried by low-density lipoproteins, while HDL cholesterol is the cholesterol carried by high-density lipoproteins. It's kind of confusing that they are called basically the same thing, but if you see the term HDLC or LDLC is referring to a cholesterol, whereas if you hear the term HDLP or LDLP is referring to the lipoproteins, and if you hear the term apolipoprotein B, it's also referring usually to the LDL proteins, not the cholesterol inside. Uh, that being said, usually you will hear that in most studies they refer to the LDL cholesterol or HDL cholesterol itself because in general that's a little bit easier to measure in routinely and obtained blood work and it can give you an idea of the amount of lipoproteins that, that are in circulation. I think you could think of these like uh, passengers and buses. If you have more passengers, generally speaking you could have more buses but there is also some room for you to have more passengers and not necessarily more buses and vice versa. So lipoproteins can be cut up by the arterial wall and form plaque. Over time this leads to arteriosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. I should note that it's the lipoproteins that are problematic and that different types of lipoproteins affect the risk of cardiovascular disease differently. And it's not really the cholesterol inside that is the problem. Again, it is usually measured as a proxy for the lipoproteins that, are, that carry this cholesterol. Uh, also, the term apolipoprotein B is just like the apolipoprotein B is a protein tag that is uh, present in all low density lipoproteins, which tend to be the more arterogenic. There are various lines of evidence that show the effects or lack thereof that different lipoproteins have on the risk of cardiovascular disease, but I will stick with just one particular line of evidence, which is the strongest line of evidence, and that is genetic studies. These are studies that compare people who have high or low concentrations of certain lipoproteins from birth due to genetic mutations on different um, genes 
An assess of these mutations change the risk of cardiovascular disease. In the case of low-density lipoproteins and apoV containing lipoproteins, this is what we see. Quote, these findings suggest that apolipoprotein B is the predominant trait that accounts for the ideological relationship of lipoprotein lipids with the risk of coronary heart disease. Quote, numerous genetic variants are associated with lower LDLC. Nearly all these variants are also associated with a corresponding lower risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease thus providing powerful naturally randomized evidence that LDL is causally associated with the risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And uh, just another one, quote, almost every genotype found to increase LDL cholesterol level by a sufficient amount has also been found to increase coronary artery disease risk. Need I say more? This is the actual consensus. The consensus is LDL lipoproteins, low-density lipoproteins, causally affect your risk of heart disease. This is not something that you're being made up by general meals or whatever. This is what the absolute sum of the evidence shows. Heck, it's one of the most well-supported facts in nutrition science. Let me just put it that way. In comparison, in the case of high-density lipoproteins, a causal role for HDLC, though possible, remains certain. Quote, taking together evidence from human hypo and hyper alpha lipoproteinemia disorders does not support that genetically determined HDL cholesterol concentrations are associated with arteriosclerotic cardiovascular disease, as will be predicted from observational studies. And quote, Mendelian randomization studies suggest that arteriosclerosis seems to be caused by the retention of apolipoprotein B carrying lipoproteins rather than by the cholesterol content carried by those lipoproteins. Again, it's the lipoproteins that cause it, not the cholesterol inside. HDL-mediated efflux of cholesterol from the arterial wall may not reduce the risk of arteriosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And this is not mechanistic. This is not just saying, oh, uh, well, this A causes B and B causes C, therefore A causes C. No, uh, the fact that replacing saturated fat in favor of unsaturated fat lowers the risk of cardiovascular disease has also been seen directly. In 2017, a systematic review of the effects of dietary saturated fat and polyunsaturated fat on heart disease was published by Clefton and Cuff. And the highlights were, quote, replacement of saturated fat with unsaturated fat lowers coronary heart disease events, and quote, replacement of saturated fat with high quality carbohydrates lowers coronary heart disease events. Again, this is one of the most well supported facts in nutrition. So in short, this is why every reputable health organization recommends against consuming too much saturated fat and that you replace it with unsaturated fat sources. Because it raises the concentration of low-density lipoproteins in the blood, which in turn raises your risk of cardiovascular disease. Rebel Fitness also takes a small job by implying that butter is healthier than canola oil and other seed oils, which is simply not supported by the evidence. As I already covered, saturated fatty acids increase your risk of cardiovascular disease in comparison to unsaturated fatty acids. Canola oil is high in unsaturated fatty acids, while butter is high in saturated fatty acids. Which is why canola oil and other non-hydrogenated seed oils are unironically and realistically better and healthier than butter and other sources of saturated fatty acids. I don't care if butter is more natural than canola oil or sunflower seed oil, it doesn't matter, the evidence shows otherwise. Human outcome data shows otherwise. It shows that these seed oils are actually a healthier alternative to things like butter and coconut oil and sources of saturated fat. And the thing is, studies have looked specifically into replacing butter with canola oil and other seed oils directly. And other seed oils directly, which supports this. Canola oil is healthier alternative to saturated fat sources. Here are just a couple of them. Quote, compared to butter, administration of cold-pressed turnip rapeseed oil, aka canola oil, was followed by a reduction of total cholesterol by 8% and low-density lipoprotein cholesterol by 11%. Next, quote, compared with values for the butter-based diet, the vegetable oil-based diets reduce serum cholesterol by 16 to 21%. LDL cholesterol by 21 to 26 percent. 
triglycerides by 10 to 21 percent and apolipoprotein B by 22 to 21 percent. So I think I made the point clear, unsaturated fat is indeed a healthier alternative to saturated fat. I don't care what diet tribes have to say about this. There might be a few exceptions with some specific foods in general in the context of certain food mat matrices, but foods that are high in saturated fat should be consumed experimentally and you should favor sources of unsaturated fatty acids. A lot of guidelines nowadays tell you outright to avoid eating meat and they're gonna start pushing you the Beyond Burger and all this other slop for it. But if they do say eating meat is okay, they're always going to say the same thing. Make sure it's lean meat, avoid red meat like it's the plague. Okay, on the next part, Revival Fitness tries to take a jab at the fact that nutrition guidelines supposedly promote plant-based meats over animal-based meats. A study was actually conducted on this question. It was a randomized crossover trial called Swap Meat, where participants were instructed to consume over two servings of plant compared with animal meats for eight weeks-ish while keeping all other foods and beverages as similar as possible between the two phases. Basically, they will do like an AP phase where they will be doing either animal-based meat or plant-based meat and then they will drop the meat they were eating for the other group. So if they were eating animal-based meat, they will start eating plant-based meat and vice versa. And they will compare the blood work that they had after that. And in short, they found that plant-based meats improve several cardiovascular disease risk factors, including LDL cholesterol. And yeah, this is some evidence that at the very least, it doesn't seem to be any worse than regular meat, and it could potentially be better in some aspects. And yeah, they did use Beyond Burgers on this trial, which although were supplied by Beyond Burger, so in that sense, they kind of did have something to do with the study. They didn't seem to have played a role in the study design. At least according to uh, Garner, which one was one of the lead authors of the study. Here's the clip. So let's see, should I apply to the NIH and wait to get rejected 10 or 12 times? Plus, <laughs> I'd have to get this meat. Okay, so I get a hold of Ethan Brown and we meet and he says, yeah, I would fund that study. And so gave it as a gift. So he had no, he doesn't get to look at the data or the design or anything like that. Um, in my own self-defense, if you can tell I'm defensive here, uh, we had a data lockdown. We had a third party statistician. We did, we took uh, pre-approved, you know, statistical plans, submitted to the NIH. It's listed on ct.gov. So I did all the right things. Now, this is this is great. Just, sorry, sorry to stop you because we get so much resistance, and I think to some to some extent it's legitimate. But people are very very wary of industry funding and any type of financial bias. So yeah, this is great giving you the giving the background of how this is these studies are done. People think the industry goes in and you know cooks the books and tells you what to publish. So this is excellent, kind of explaining what they do and don't control, and how this is uh, generally managed. Though this was only one study and not many have been done on, the, on these plant-based meat alternatives, they don't seem to be any worse than regular meats, in any case. But with that being said, the dietary guidelines make no mention of beyond burgers or even plant-based burgers. I mean, open the guidelines, just press Ctrl F and try to see if there is any mention of beyond burgers. I tried to look for it, I couldn't find it. I'm not sure where he got that people are being widely recommended to this swap by health organizations. I mean, it will probably be a good uh, swap for the environment since around three quarters of agricultural land is destined towards raising cattle, where, whether directly or by animal feed. But health-wise, to be honest, I will expect that more studies come out before it becomes a serious widespread recommendation. But again, so far, the evidence does indicate that it might be a healthier alternative. Removing a high amount of the vitamins and minerals in these foods whenever you remove the fat, because the fat is where they're all found. For example, the yolks and eggs, the fat in milk, the fat in meat, etc. Let's assume that you don't even care about the vitamins and minerals. Let's just say they're off the table for now. You are going to not get nearly as many calories in your diet if you remove the fat from it. Fat is more calorically dense per gram than protein or carbs, so if you're removing or really limiting high-fat sources of food in your diet, guys, you're going to make bulking harder than it needs to be if you do not have a big appetite genetically. I do want to say that I do agree with the point he makes here. Um, yes, you don't need to reduce your total fat intake, and especially if you are bulking, it will make things harder than they need to be. And I will say just replace your fat sources, you know, Instead of cooking with butter, lard or tallow, use healthy alternatives like canola oil, olive oil or sunflower oil. All of these are better options and they will still allow you to hit your caloric goal. 
And the last thing to consider here, at least that I can think of right now, is eating very high fiber. And this relates back to the prior point, the mainstream dietary advice is geared toward people who are heavy, they need to suppress their appetite, and fiber is one way to do that. So carb sources that are higher in fiber are by default harder to overeat because the body can't really even digest fiber. It ends up turning into bulk, it takes up space in the stomach, and this leads to delayed hunger signaling. People with genetically very high appetites, a lot of the times they don't even have to consciously bulk because if left to their own devices, they will be in a surplus and gain fat more easy by default. But when it comes to the skinny guys and to the hard gainers, you're gonna have to work as hard at eating in a surplus as the other person is at consciously eating less. Okay, we're done with fat, now let's cover fiber a little bit. He mentions that fiber is satiating and as such not very conducive to, bulk, to a bulk. And while it is true that fiber is satiating, you do want to keep some in your diet. So he implies that the only reason that is good is for digestion, and that's part of it, but there are other reasons behind it. So during a bulk, it's still a good idea to keep a reasonable fiber intake in your diet. This is because fiber also helps to regulate your LDL levels. As I referenced earlier, this is a good thing. If you have a very high levels of low density of proteins, that can be uh, conducive to heart disease later in life. It helps to regulate your blood sugar levels, and it also helps to keep the diversity of your gut microbiome, among other things. So I will say yes, even if you're bulking, you should have at least some more fiber in your diet. Maybe like, you know, the guidelines at the very least, something like 13 grams per 1000 calories or something like that, at minimum. On a final note, I do want to say that if you are informed on the scientific method, you know how to read papers, and are familiar enough with nutrition science, or any other area of science for that matter, to be able to do your own research, it is absolutely worth looking at the evidence yourself. But that being said, if you are not able to do that, you are better off taking advice from actual nutrition authorities or contacting a competent dietitian than by taking advice from journalists, social media diet gurus, or random meatheads on YouTube. There's a lot of misinformation out there here. Nutrition science seems really confusing for the general public, but yeah, be careful where you get your information from, is all I will say. Okay, so lastly, I want to cover the discussion I had with Revolve Fitness on the comment section. Uh, so I basically replied with a summarized version of the stuff we covered here in this video, and his reply was this. You cannot be taken seriously claiming canola oil is healthier than butter. Basic biochemistry shows that saturated fats are much more stable than PFA, polyunsaturated fatty acids, and result in less oxidative stress and inflammation. I already covered why this is simply not the case. In actual human outcome data, not just your basic biochemistry, in actual human outcome data, replacing saturated fatty acids with polyunsaturated fatty acids reduces the cardiovascular disease risk. I already covered this, but just for fun, here are some more studies that have found the same thing. Clifton and colleagues 2017, quote, replacing saturated fat with polyunsaturated fatty acids, monounsaturated fatty acids, or high quality carbohydrate will lower coronary heart disease risk events. Mosafarian and colleagues 2010, quote, these findings provide evidence that consuming polyunsaturated fatty acids in place of saturated fatty acids reduces coronary heart disease events in randomized clinical trials. This suggests that rather than trying to lower polyunsaturated fatty acid consumption, achieve toward greater population polyunsaturated fatty acid consumption in place of saturated fatty acid consumption will significantly reduce rates of coronary heart disease. Lee and colleagues, 2015, quote, our findings indicate that unsaturated fats, especially polyunsaturated fatty acids and or high quality carbohydrates can be used to replace saturated fats to reduce coronary heart disease risk. In fact, I have a hard time finding studies where cardiovascular events got worse after replacing saturated fat sources with sources of non-hydrogenated unsaturated fatty acids. If there is any studies like that, feel free to send them my way, but I fail to find them. Everything that I find points towards the opposite direction. So yeah, I'm sorry, but your basic biochemistry doesn't mean anything when actual human outcome data says otherwise. He then says, humans evolve eating primarily saturated, parenthesis, animal, fat, slash meat. Carbon isotope data prove this. 
The implication that because we as a species have been eating meats for thousands of years is somehow evidence that meat is particularly healthy. Look, I get it. I get it. It, it can be counterintuitive. You may think that if we have eaten something for a very long time, then it must be healthy. But it doesn't really work like that. So in evolution, there is a phenomenon called antagonistic pleiotropy, where something that can increase fitness early on in life can also be detrimental later in life. To take an example here, animal fat is readily available in basically most environments, if not every environment. Uh, it is calorically dense and it could have very well offered an advantage early on by preventing starvation. This can allow a person to survive to reproductive age and even raise their kids, yet at the same time be increasing arterogenic particles like apolipoprotein B and LDL that will cause heart disease later in life. Keep in mind that heart disease takes decades to progress. You can make it to your 30s or 40s while eating foods that will increase your risk of dying in your 60s or 70s. I mean, take this from someone that studies biology in university and took various courses on biological evolution. The long-term health effects of food past reproductive age are basically beyond the scope of evolution. That is, what we ha that is the reason we have nutrition science for. Not to mention when you're looking at these, you know, where these hunter-gatherer tribes or ancient human pop populations, you're also looking at a pre-selected population. You have to understand they have higher rates of infant mortality as well as higher rates of mortality from other causes. So like, you know, if you're dying from malaria, yeah, you're probably not gonna die of heart disease, but you know, that is not particularly helpful towards where your food items were causing you uh, to, were causing the progression of heart disease if you ultimately end up dying of something else. We have no way of knowing this stuff. So yeah, I mean, evolution is a great theory. It's definitely the foundation for all of biology. I would highly suggest you read more into it. Because it's not as simple as, oh, we have been eating X, therefore X is healthy. It really is not like that. If you want to know if a given food is healthy or not, we actually have nutrition science for that. Talking about nutrition science, nutrition science may seem confusing for lay people, but there is an actual method to its madness. When you want to evaluate the strength of evidence that supports a claim, look at the studies that are behind it. If there are no studies, you can dismiss it right away, which already should throw most of the confusion out of the window. And if there are studies, based on the type of studies that are behind it, you can have more or less confidence on its veracity. The types of studies can be evaluated in a hierarchy of evidence. At the very bottom, these are the ones that have the higher risk of bias and the, lo uh, the lower quality of evidence. You're gonna have things like editorials, experts' opinion, a little bit higher, you're gonna see mechanistic studies like, you know, it does this in rats, or it's more stable, or whatever. Then you have case reports, case studies, like this one person ate this and this happened, stuff like that. Then you have cross-sectional studies and surveys. This can be more useful seeing population trends and stuff along those lines. Then you have case control studies, like actually mm, studies that you know maybe follow a group of people in a more uh, controlled environment. You then have epidemiology and cohort studies that you follow like tens of thousands of people, you see what they are eating, and then you see how that relates to different events that they have throughout their lives. Then you have randomized controlled clinical trials or RCTs, where you basically control what people are doing during a given period of time and you see so how something can affect a certain parameter. So for example, for some of the studies we had we uh, saw before, you will like say have them in a metabolic ward and have one group eating more saturated fat or one eating more polyunsaturated fat and you will see what happens with the biomarkers and in that case you will see that they will improve with both us but you know and then you have like systematic reviews and meta-analysis of RCTs which basically just look at you know various RCTs that were con uh, conducted on different populations on a given question and they are at the higher end of the quality of evidence Generally speaking, that's a good rule of thumb, like if you see that there is this study in animals or in a petri dish that says one thing, but then actual human outcome data says a different thing, you can usually trust the actual human outcome data over this basic biochemistry or this rat study or whatever. In short, all else being equal, human outcome data will supersede animal studies, mechanistic speculations or petri dish stuff. In this case, I've shown various randomized clinical trials, systematic reviews, and meta-analysis, and the best you can do is some mechanistic speculation based on basic biochemistry. Yeah, I have a more solid ground to stand on. 
He then says many of the evidence-based nutrition experts are bought and paid for, so singling out Nina as a contrarian is smooth. I kind of agree, but my point is that what she's saying goes against scientific consensus and the studies that have been cons uh, actually done on the matter, so that's my problem with her. Yeah, you're gonna see, you know, conflicts of interest, but... Which, by the way, um, even Nina doesn't always disclose her own conflicts of interest. Uh, there is an interesting article of this, so I will also link it here. But, yeah, I mean, you cannot dismiss a study based exclusively on conflicts of interest, but my problem was that the stuff you are claiming goes against the evidence that we have from nutrition science. He then says, there is no way to inform on a health risk of any specific food or macronutrient. You will have to keep people locked in a lab and control their diet, their entire diet for their entire life. Most nutrition studies are epidemiological self-service, which are bunk in terms of real science. So, in reality, you can test for health benefits of foods, macronutrients, and micronutrients. This can be done by cohort studies, metabolic wards, randomized trials, Mendelian randomization, etc. Epidemiological studies are not bunked when you use properly a statistically adjusted uh, for methods. They can be very informative on the effects of specific foods on overall health. Sure, ideally you will do RCTs, but there are certain questions that you cannot really have RCTs. Though for those questions, we can actually use well, in some cases, we can use stuff like Mendelian randomization, which is basically a naturally occurring RCT. And he then says, um, since PFAS and plants have become dominant in the mainstream diet, health issues have skyrocketed. Hmm. <laughs> Are you serious? Like, uh, really? Re really? D don't you see the irony here? Are you so oblivious to what you just wrote? Look, when all you look at is two separate trends, you don't make any adjustments for confounding factors. Yeah, that type of associations, if you want to call it epidemiology, that's pretty much garbage can useless. What you did there was useless, to say the least. You cannot just look at trend for X, trend for Y, and yeah, okay, they're going in the same direction, therefore one is causing the other. No. You, you actually need to use statistical methods. You actually need to use proper adjustments. You need to account for, co for co-founders. That's why you, what epidemiology is for. Though I will say that it's kind of funny that, you know, you reference a poorly done epidemiology to try to make your point right after saying how epidemiology doesn't work and we cannot do anything, and we cannot know anything about nutrition science. Tell me, Revival Fitness, is your problem just with well-done epidemiology? Like, do you have no problem with poorly done uh, associations, you just have a problem with like the stuff that is actually uh, that actually has a statistical strength behind it. Anyway, I have to say it's quite a fit to get so much stuff wrong. Uh, hopefully you will reconsider some of your current beliefs, but I do want to say that overall, again, your training advice is not particularly bad. I hope you can improve the quality of your nutrition advice such that you actually say stuff that matches with reality. With that being said, this video took a while to make, uh, don't necessarily expect more long format videos responses for a while, but I do like nutrition science, so occasionally I may do more. And again, Revolt Fitness, if you reply to this, I will make a follow-up at some point. See you next time!